Hi, Management 4300 students. This is Steve Wagner, and this is a series of lectures on Chapter 7, which focuses on economic issues in labor relations. There, your book uses a term called wage differentials, and, and this is just a fancy way of saying that uh, people get paid different amounts based on uh, the job that they have, the experience that they have, the organization that they work for, and, and a lot of other factors. Um, not every uh, job, not every person gets paid the same. So what do wages and benefits represent? Well, they represent different things to the employer than they do to the employee. Now, to the employee, the wages and benefits represent a standard of living. It represents the financial resources they earn from their work to pay for essential things like uh, shelter and food and and, and other things uh, uh, for themselves that make up their standard of living. For a business, the uh, wages and benefits represent a cost, a cost that uh, something that uh, lowers potential profits. And so uh, wages and benefits represent something that managers need to focus on controlling in order to uh, achieve the profits that the business expects it to achieve. Now, why are these uh, there these wage differentials? Uh, now, if we focus on uh, differences between uh, industries and organizations, there's a number of reasons we can see that uh, people would be paid differently depending on, on where they work and, and, and what type of industry they're in. We can look at the competitiveness of the industry. Uh, if there is a high degree of competitiveness, uh, then uh, there is more focus on controlling costs because customers are driven largely by cost. And so uh, in, the, in those types of industries, uh, we may see wages uh, being suppressed by this need to uh, be competitive. Uh, we can also look at whether there is a monopoly in the product market. And if there is, then there also might be a monopoly in the uh, labor market. Uh, so companies uh, who are in the market for hiring specialized work, if they're the only ones who have that work, um, they also can keep the, the cost of work down. We also have to look at how much value do workers add to the product that is being sold in a particular industry. So let's compare uh, the, the, the medicine to fast food. How about that? Um, if we look at workers in the medical field, um, they add a lot of value. Uh, we, when we're going to a doctor, we're talking high stakes. It's a, a life or death or health issue. And, and so the skills of a particular doctor can add a, a large amount of value uh, to the workers and might determine, um, you know, where you want to be treated are the particular workers that are working there. If we look at fast food, uh, fast food workers uh, are put into an organization where the work is highly standardized, where they don't have to come in with a, a high degree of specialized skills, uh, and uh, the, the work is fairly routine. Um, and, and so not as much value uh, being added by workers in the fast food industry as there is in the, the medical industry. We could look, also look at how, what percentage of the cost of the product or the service is represented by the cost of labor. In uh, higher ed, for instance, the cost of running a university, the percentage of the total budget, is oftentimes made up 75 to 80 percent in the cost of labor. So uh, there is a large percentage there uh, that uh, is determining the, the, the cost of tuition, is the, the, the cost of hiring professors and administrators and, and others to run the university. Um, the uh, other industries especially industries that require uh, a lot of specialized equipment, 
um, where, uh, for instance, um, uh, drilling for oil. Uh, it, it takes an incredible amount of equipment, expensive equipment, to drill oil from the bottom of the ocean floor. Okay, And so the cost represented by that equipment is a, a higher percentage uh, than it would be in other industries. And as a, a factor, then the, the labor costs for uh, producing oil uh, are a lower percentage than, let's say, the labor costs to produce education. And the tasks and the duties that people do on a job also can be very relevant for determining how much to pay a job because it, uh, it can tell us uh, what types of conditions a person is working in and, and, and whether those conditions might require that we pay more to retain people in those positions, especially if those conditions have factors that are aversive, that, that make people feel uncomfortable, or even put people in positions uh, where there's potential danger. Now, again, we said that uh, the job description and the uh, job specification come from job analysis, okay, and but they're relevant for the, the process of determining the wages for a job, okay, and that process is referred to as job evaluation. Okay, job evaluation determines what is the job worth to the organization. And there's different ways of doing this. Uh, one of the simplest is just ranking. And it may seem too simple, but in a small organization, this may be all you need to do is to compare each job to every other job and to create a hierarchy of jobs. Okay, and so this is this is basically uh, a, a very simple process. Um, it can be done different ways. Um, you can just do a straight ranking, okay? Or you could take each job and, and compare it against each other job, um, and, and that's called paired comparison. Um, but if, if that's uh, not enough, uh, we can get into the process of classification. Okay, this is grouping similar jobs uh, based on their value. And uh, finally, there is a system called, uh, called the point system. And this is where we take factors uh, related to compensation, like the conditions under which people work, or the human uh, uh, skills and knowledge that are, are necessary to be successful in the job, and, and determining uh, how much they're present in a job and how much they should increase the value or the worth of that job. Now, here's an example of a wage structure. Um, this is organized by job, but we can see that what they've done is use the point system here uh, to determine uh, how many points uh, the each job has. And basically, uh, again, jobs uh, get points based on uh, both the working conditions and the human attributes that it me needs to be, uh, a person needs to be successful to do that job. So we can see that those jobs that uh, are lower skilled, okay, are receiving less points than those jobs that are higher skilled. Okay, we can also see that that some of these jobs uh, might require uh, working in conditions that can be fairly aversive. Okay, um, so electricians uh, run the risk of uh, being electrocuted, <laughs> uh, and as could be a, a matter of discomfort all the way to death. Again, uh, the electrician we see is receiving a, a, a high number of points, uh, and we can, can imagine that that's both because they have uh, skills that are in demand and also that they have to work in conditions 
that uh, some people just don't want to work in. So when we are looking at the conditions of a job and, and the skills and the knowledge that is necessary to do it, that is job evaluation. And we think of that as an internal process or internal factors that uh, are used to determine the worth or the value of a job. Uh, oftentimes that's not enough information in an organization, especially if there is some degree of competition that they are facing. Uh, and so it's often necessary to look at external factors, what other companies are paying comparable workers. Uh, and, and so we determine that through wage surveys. And these surveys uh, are done by uh, the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, if you've uh, ever seen ONET, which is an online database of jobs, uh, it's a great tool. I have a link for it up in our supplementary materials. And if you uh, look up a job and scroll down to the bottom of an ONET profile, you will see wage information that is collected by the Department of Labor. So it's a great source of, of finding information on wages. Okay, There's the uh, National Compensation Survey or the Occupational Pay Relatives, uh, both of which are, are processes or surveys uh, that are uh, administered by the Department of Labor. Sometimes we look at trade or professional groups to get wage information. So the National Retail Federation is an example of a trade group. Uh, retailers like Target and Sears and Walmart belong to uh, the National Retail Federation because they provide good information like wage surveys. Sometimes an employer Initi initiates a survey on their own. Be aware that that's a lot of work, so this is typically uh, done with very large employees, uh, employers, um, where smaller employers usually rely on existing databases from the Department of Labor or trade groups. And of course, sometimes unions initiate surveys. Um, again, because uh, an employer survey might pick uh, comparable uh, organizations that are uh, represent lower paying, whereas a union might say, wait a second, uh, I think if we pick different organizations, we would get different results. And so sometimes you see both employers and unions doing wage surveys and then debating about whose data is more accurate. So here we see the typical results of a wage server. Again, we see the types of jobs that we, we saw in our, our previous uh, uh, table. Um, and uh, along the top, we see that uh, the data represents uh, wages for different jobs in different organizations, organization A, organization B, organization C. And again, uh, this is very useful for an organization because pay is often a strategic decision because it affects not only a cost, but also a capability of the organization. So many organizations want to be at least around the average, okay, because they don't want to be too high uh, because that will run up the cost of their product or service and make them less competitive. But they don't want to be too low because then they may not be attracting the best workers that might limit the organization's capabilities to execute uh, their strategy and their tactics in order to deliver those products and services.